We're going to have the first class of 2022, and we're going to start with a really serious subject. And of course, I want to mention, there's no better New Year's resolution than to study more Torah. So I'd like to take a moment to let you know that I am privileged to host six different Torah and Jewish podcasts that I would encourage you to give a listen if you have not yet tried it out. Of course, there's Torah 101 and Intellectuals, Introduction to Torah, the Parsha podcast, which offers two episodes a week on the weekly Parsha, the Jewish History podcast, which, as you know, has been a bit neglected in 2021. I hope to remedy that. I hope to remedy that in 2022. You have the Ethics podcast, where we talk about Perkei Avos, the Mitzvah podcast. We're studying the 613 Mitzvos, and then there's this Jewish Life, which talks about Jewish life and Jewish wisdom and Jewish philosophy and Mitzvos in a more detailed fashion, in a more practical fashion, the weekly, uh, the, the yearly calendar. Give those a listen if you want to boost your Torah study in 2022. Plus, there's also a show that aggregates them all. It's called the Rabbi Yaakov Wolby Podcast Collection or all Rabbi Yaakov Wolby Podcasts. But that's only for the diehard fans, not for regular people. But give it a listen, give it a nice five-star rating, and share them with your friends. Let's make 2022 the year of Torah. We have a lot of things that divide us. We're a divided nation. There's two Americas. But there's one thing we all agree upon, and that is that studying more Torah in 2022 will make a happier, healthier, more cohesive society. And as always, the email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. We are in the 10th of the 13th of the 13 principles of faith, and we're talking about the idea of divine omniscience. God knows everything, and nothing is hidden from him. God didn't create the world and say, you know what, I'm going to leave y'all to your devices. He didn't create the world and then abandon the world to other forces. He is actively involved in the world. He oversees everything. Nothing happens without his oversight. Everything is still continuously dependent upon him. And part of that is that all of our thoughts and all of our deeds and all of our actions and all of our words are completely known to God even before they happen. The Jewish definition of God is that he is above, he is removed from time and space. He created time and space, but he is not in the strictures of time and space. He exists outside of it. In fact, the ineffable name of God, the name of God that we're not allowed to pronounce on a basic level, the basic meaning of that word is that the Almighty is unbound from time and space. And therefore, the concept of time does not apply to God. So he knows everything even before it happens. He exists concurrently now in the past and in the future, and he knows everything past, present, and future. And of course, this is something that's really hard for us to wrap our heads around. You know, we can't imagine, we can't fathom existing in different points of time simultaneously because that's just the limitations of our world. But the Almighty exists outside of time, and therefore he knows everything past, present, and future. The time, so to speak, that limitation does not apply to God. Now, last time we talked about the subject, we mentioned a very interesting and problematic dilemma, one perhaps that is the most difficult and intractable problems in all of our philosophy, in all of our theology, and that is the coexistence of free will, meaning that us humans, we can determine our destiny, we can make our choices, and that's free. It's unbound. The Almighty doesn't determine what's going to be with our choices. If we're righteous, if we're wicked, that's in our hands, and that's not in God's hands. How does free will coexist with the Almighty knowing everything ahead of time? If the Almighty knows everything ahead of time, 
well then it seems like the future the destiny is already set in stone and therefore how can we have free will so we believe in a concept of free will man and of course whenever we say man unless it's in a gender specific context it's talking about humanity in general man mankind they have the ability we have the ability to determine our destiny we're not going to be pulled to one end over another we're free to choose what our destiny is it's our choices and our choices alone and therefore we could be rewarded for our mitzvahs we could be punished for our transgressions and we have to say of course there are a lot of forces that are pushing us and pulling us and prodding us there's the good inclination the eights are tov wants us to do mitzvahs there's the yetzahara evil inclination wants us to stumble and make mistakes you could have good influences you know good family good community good education good friends you can have bad friends bad influences there's a lot of other forces that go into trying to push us and pull us but ultimately our choices are ours alone and therefore we are held accountable for them but if god knows the end he knows it's all ahead of time well your destiny is already at least in in god's sphere it's all predetermined so here's the question how does divine foreknowledge not contradict free will how does the almighty's foreknowledge not equal determinism as if everything's already predetermined ahead of time the destiny is already set in stone and we're just going through the motions we don't have a say how is it possible that we could have two things that seem to be mutually exclusive we believe in these two bedrock principles that seem to be incompatible it seems like you can have one but not the other but we believe in both both are core non-negotiable immutable principles of our faith and how do we reconcile this paradox this is a famous question this is an ancient question this is a very difficult question and this is the question that i want to ponder and probe and examine today the money knows everything he knows everything ahead of time yet we have a say yet there is an element there is a component of life that it's man mankind humanity we have a say in determining what's going to happen and that choice is ours it is free it is unbound can these actually coexist this is a very famous question this is an ancient question this is a question that's discussed in many different places in jewish literature primarily the very old and ancient literature we'll talk more about that in a little bit because it's a subject a lot of people are scared to dip their toe into for good reason because we are wading in to the question of the almighty's operating system and that's something which is beyond us as we shall see so the question is much more satisfying than the answer as we shall see but nevertheless i think it's important to, important to discuss it and to see what we know what we don't know what we can figure out what are the limitations of our ability to to access a framework to understand this so let's begin and we're going to try to go into it i think a little bit gently a little bit gingerly because there are a lot of related kind of um adjacent subjects or questions that we can ask in 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 this in this idea in this paradigm so let's introduce maybe a related question an easier question and then move on to the more difficult aspects of this subject a homicide a theft a break in a crime committed by one person against someone else how do we understand that philosophically God forbid a man chooses to murder someone else is this a violation of the idea that the mind determines what happens well if someone murders someone else who determined that the that the dead person that the victim 
of this horrific crime, who determined that that victim should die? It's a part of the Almighty's oversight and the Almighty's providence and the Almighty's fear, and he's in charge and he determines what happens. Nothing can happen against his will. Or is this the product of a criminal's free will? Man used his free will, ostensibly, to end someone else's life. But what was God's position on this matter? And this is a little bit of a tricky question, because if God wanted the guy dead, then maybe you could argue that the murderer is but a tool, an implement in God's hands. So why are we punishing him? And if God didn't want the person dead, then we see a human overriding the will of God. We see again this conflict that God has a plan, God has the oversight, God has the providence, and then there's free will and comes on free will. And it seems like, you know, man's making the decision and not God. Can man's free will overcome God's free will or God's will? It's an interesting question. Now, it's, it's, it's related to our subject. Our subject is that God has you know, total knowledge, total power, total oversight of the world. But man also has a say. And if man has a say, well, to the degree that man has the say, God does not have the say. And to the degree that God has the say, man doesn't have a say. So it's a very tricky problem that everyone's trying to figure out where exactly those two points meet. Now, I was looking at my notes. Turns out a couple of years ago, we spoke about the subject at length. We spoke about the limits of free will. You know, how far can it go? Can my free will affect you? Because you, apparently, you should have your own oversight. So the idea of free will, maybe free will, a person can affect themselves. But what happens when free will, one person's free will, person A's free will, impacts or encroaches upon person person B. So how far does free will, like how far is it unleashed? We can understand the concept. The mind says, you know what? You determine your destiny, determine your future. That makes sense. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold off. I'm going to let you make those decisions. But can a person's free will impact and encroach upon someone else? That's a very difficult question. It's a very controversial question, and there are reputable opinions on either side of this very vexing problem. There are those that say that unless the victim is so righteous that the Almighty intervenes and changes the rules of nature, unless that is true, one person's free will indeed can encroach upon the life even of person B. Meaning, the homicide victim is innocent. God wants him alive. But God says, you know what? I'm going to allow humanity to make terrible choices. Also, you know, good choices, bad choices, awful choices, terrible choices, criminal choices. I'm going to allow that as well. And I'm going to allow this to be unleashed even to the fatal detriment of other people. That is one school of thought. Today, I want to quote a different approach taken from the Emunos Videos of Sa'ad Yagon. So we're talking about like, you know, 13, 12, 1300 years ago. This is not a new opinion or a new question. This goes back to very ancient times. And he has a very beautiful formulation, which again, we're not taking sides in these debates. I'll make that clear. We know nothing. I know nothing. We're just trying to go through the sources and see what they say. We had the Arachim we talked about last time. We had the Gona Vilna opines on this matter as well. We are nothing compared to those giants, and we're not going to take a stand, but we're going to offer the kind of the lay of the land as we as we see it. So in the Amunos Videos of Sa'ad Yagon, one of the Gona, because this is before Rashi, this is a long time ago, he says something really interesting. It's a it's a nice, it's a nice and neat formulation, which I think helps us understand this subject more broadly. When a murder happens, 
he divides the act and the result. He says, the murder, well, that's the handiwork of the murderer. The crime, the deed, is the act of the murderer. The result, the fact that the victim is now dead, well, that's the act of God. God wanted him dead. There's no way a person can kill someone who God wants alive. Now, it's not clear from the reading of, of his text if that's referring only to tzaddikim, only to righteous people, because he's talking in the context of you know the stories in the prophets where evil kings and queens killed prophets. So maybe it's limited to prophets, but you know, common criminals is maybe not like that. So that's just, we have to put a pin in that. But he says that when a righteous prophet is murdered by Izebel, terrible, wicked queen. Well, she's the murderer, and the deed of murder, the homicide act, is hers. But the fact that the righteous prophet died, that is the desire of God. Separate the two. Bifurcate the action from the result. Decouple the action from the result. The action was done by the criminal. The result, well, that is what God wanted. And you know what? If the criminal didn't kill the righteous prophet, he would have had a heart attack and died nonetheless. Similarly, when there is a break-in, there is a theft, a robbery, the act of crime, so to speak, of the robber, of the thief, of the intruder, that's their choice. The loss of value to the homeowner, that is God's decision. And if they didn't lose it that way, they would have lost it in some other fashion. So then this is a very helpful formulation for a lot of the free will questions that we could ponder. You know, because the, the concept of free will, it applies everywhere in our life. Our whole life is about trying to improve ourselves, making making better choices and choosing good outcomes, good approaches, good paths in life. That's what all, all life is really all about, that. On an individual level, on a communal level, on a national level, global level, you know, the most basic destiny concept of, of uh, the basic destiny we're all striving for is the idea of Messiah. Well, who, who brings about Messiah? The Torah tells us Messiah is going to come, whether we help or not. Yet, we're told that our actions contribute towards, towards the redemption. So is it up to us, or is it up to God? We could say the same formulation. The process, well, that's, that's us. The net result, that's God. We could even add that sometimes the choice doesn't determine the outcome, but it, but it determines the nature of that outcome. Meaning, the Talmud tells us, Messiah will come in one of two ways. Either in a generation that's entirely righteous, or in a generation that's entirely wicked. Now, by the way, Messiah is one of the upcoming 13 principles of faith, so we're going to talk more about Messiah coming up soon. Please, God. But the Talmud tells us, Messiah is a result of our actions. And then it tells us, well, what kind of actions effectuate Messiah? Really, really, really good ones. The whole generation is entirely righteous. And really, 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 really bad ones the complete opposite side of the spectrum. Well, which is it? What kinds of actions determine this outcome? The answer is every single kind of action determines this outcome, but that outcome, the process that brings about that outcome could be very different. I've said this in the past. It's very controversial. I'll say it again, because I still think it's true. The Torah tells us we're going to go back to Israel. It says it in the Torah. And you know what? Now, we could see in history, it's actually happened. It happened actually more than once. It's happened twice in all of human history where a nation was banished from its land and they came back and they reestablished hegemony over the land. It happened twice. Once with the Jews and a second time with the Jews. 
That's it. All of human history, twice. Temples destroyed, first temple. Jews are dragged out of the land. They go to Babylon. They're slaves. They come back and they reestablish the second commonwealth. The second temple is rebuilt. And the Jews flourish in the land with, of course, ups and downs for hundreds of years. And then the Romans come and they make life very difficult for the Jews in Israel. They, of course, destroy the second temple. Jews leave, go to Babylon, go to other parts of the world, to Persia, North Africa, Europe. And 2,000 years later, the largest Jewish community, the Jewish country in the world is, of course, back where we all, where it all started as predicted the Torah. But is there a different way that it could have happened? This is the controversy. We know that the greatest or the, the most horrific genocide in all of human history happened right before the Jews got back to Israel. And it's not unreasonable to argue that the way we got the land of Israel was via the horrific genocide, the worst genocide in all of human history. That's not unreasonable to argue, as painful as it is to talk about. The Torah tells us you're going to go back to the land of Israel. It doesn't tell us how that's going to work, under what circumstances. Is it possible we could have gotten it in a more pleasant way? I think so. Again, it's all counterfactuals. We don't know. It's all hypothetical. But you can imagine a different way this could have happened. It seems like, again, the destination, the net result, is predetermined. But the process, well, that's up to our free will. Again, this idea of, you know, God's dominion and our dominion and where the two meet and how the two interrelate, we have now a nice framework, a nice formulation that comes from, a, again, a very reputable source from one of the great Geonim, one of the most important people of, of our history, Sa'ad Yagon. He makes this distinction between the process and the result, and the process is more up to us. The result is in the hands of God. But again, this is a related question to the one we're talking about. This is about the conflict of free will versus the will of God. Our question is much more fundamental. How is free will actually free? Can it even exist at all? If everything is already predetermined, or at least it's present in the divine foreknowledge, well, do we even have something called free will? And to go into the subject fundamentally, the place where everyone starts is the Rambam's fifth chapter of the laws of repentance. Free will is obviously related to the subject of repentance because repentance is when you make a mistake and you want to fix it. That whole idea, that whole concept, that whole notion is only possible if free will actually exists. You made a mistake, you made a choice, you made a bad choice, come fix it with a good choice. If we're just, you know, pre-programmed robots, there's no such a thing as repentance, there's no such thing as guilt for a bad decision or reward for a good decision, because after all, we're just pawns, we're just puppets in the hands of some grand master, some puppeteer. So he dedicates chapter five of the Lord's Repentance to the concept of free will, and it's fascinating, and I want to go through it with y'all today. He starts off by just, again, introducing the whole subject of free will. Rishus l'chol adam nesun. Every person is given the rights to choose their behavior. If you want to veer yourself towards a good path and to be a tzaddik, well, you have the ability to do that. If you want to veer yourselves towards a bad path and to be a wicked person, again, you have the ability to do that. You have the free will to choose your destiny. Now, again, this subject appears elsewhere. He's, in fact, going to bring more sources to this. We have verses in Scripture. <coughs> Excuse me. We have verses in Scripture that talk about... <coughs> we have verses in Scripture that talk about free will. We have the teachings in the Talmud that talk about how everything, or a lot of stuff are predetermined. You can't determine your IQ, your height, your eye color, your hair color what kind of family you're going to be born into, 
a lot of things are out of your control. What kind of physique you're going to have? How tall and handsome will you be? Some things are out of our control, but to be a tzaddik or a rasha, to be a righteous person, a wicked person, that is not predetermined in the Talmud tells us in the book of Nida, page 16b. Everything is in the hands of heaven, besides for fear of heaven. Continues the Rambo. Man is the only one, of course, besides God, who has this ability. And quotes a verse in Genesis, man became like one of us to know good and bad. Explains the Rambam, what does that mean? This species of humanity is a sole singular entity in the world, and there's no other species like this one in his capacity to know, in his knowledge, in his thought, what's good and what's bad, and having the ability to choose which one of those to seek, to pursue, to choose, and no one stops them. No one stops them from being good, and no one stops them from being bad. The similarities between us and God is in this area. We have the ability to choose. The apes can choose. The kangaroos can choose. The angels can choose. We can. And of course, we could talk about the fact that, you know, humanity, we're really a hybrid creature. We've spoken about this many times in the past. Humans are a hybrid. You know, our bodies, our physicality is like a pretty pretty weak animal. You know, there's no animal that's our size that can't rip us to shreds. You know, physically, we're not that remarkable. But we also have the intellect. We also have the spiritual side of our of our existence, and that's more like an angel, even perhaps even higher than an angel. And those two are fused together by divine decree in a way that it's really unfathomable to us how humans even exist. We're a mixture, we're a fusion of an angel and an animal, and we're also given space, we're given independence to choose which one of those halves to prioritize, to become an amazing angel, to become an awful beast that is in our hands. And by the way, this is something we're going to talk about a little bit later. You see such a distribution, such diversity in righteousness amongst humans. You know, you have, you have the grumpy animals and the more energetic, ebullient animals, you know, the dog that loves to bark and the one that just sits sullen on the couch. You've seen that. But with respect to righteousness and morality, you only have distribution or wide distribution amongst, amongst humans. Everything else is pre-programmed. The trees, you know, you'll, all the Trees, they follow their they follow their DNA. They follow the way their 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 nature, their nature determines. If it's a tall tree, they'll all be tall. So I'll be taller than others, but they'll all be tall. If it's a little bush, they'll all, all be short. Grass is kind of always green. Besides for if you live in Houston. Then it's kind of white or yellow, whatever. But that at least in theory, it's supposed to be green. You know, the, the water is really all the same. It's, it's just water. You know. Everything follows its nature. And then you have humans who win Nobel Peace Prizes and improve the world and dedicate themselves to the world and are generous and kind and, and helpful and, and sweet and beautiful in every way. And you have humans that are criminals that do awful, terrible, beastly things. There's such a wide distribution, such diversity, because we're endowed with free will. And therefore, there's going to be a wide distribution of choices because there's so many different choices to be made. The grass, the trees, the animals, the angels, they don't have that ability. And therefore they're all, again, within within limitations, within uh, you know a, a small bandwidth, they're all going to do the same thing, what they're programmed to do. Humans are not programmed, and that's why there's such diversity. Continues the Rambam. So again, he's introducing the idea of, of free will, how it makes us unique, this is what makes us like God. And then he says, don't consider the possibility that the fools have, or that the fools believe, that the Almighty determines or decrees upon man from the beginning of man's creation 
to be a tzaddik or a rasha. Don't think that everything's predetermined. Ain hadavar kain. The matter is not so. And lekol adam, every person, can be as righteous as Moshe, or as wicked as Jeroboam, and can be wise or foolish, can be merciful or cruel, can be stingy or generous, and all the qualities. Every quality is distributed, you know, the really good and the really bad, and then the, the golden middle. Every person can end up at every part of the spectrum of every one of those characteristics. And every person can be as righteous as Moshe. It's been pointed out, the Ram doesn't even say every Jew. Every single human can be as righteous as Moshe. Meaning, if a human does all, makes all their choices, the right choices, of course, they're not going to end up at Mount Sinai with tablets teaching the Jews Torah. That's only Moshe. But if you do everything that you can do, the Bible does not expect you to do things that you cannot do. And therefore, every person can, again, provided they make all the right choices, end up as righteous as Moshe on their own relative scale. No one will compel you. No one will coerce you. No one will decree upon you. No one will pull you to one of the two sides. Rather, he himself and according to his choices, will veer to the path that he chooses. Quotes the verse. P.L. Yon lo teitze haros v'atovos. Quotes is the verse in, in, in Eicha, in Lamentations. From, high of, from, uh, from on high, it will not be determined, not the good and not the bad. The Almighty, the Creator, does not decree upon man to be good and does not decree upon man to be bad. And therefore, explains the Rambam, if someone's a sinner, it's their loss. It's their choices. It's their choices. They made those choices, and therefore they have to suffer the consequences. And if someone made a sin, they should cry, and they should repent, and they should lament their choices and try to improve it. Because that choice was their handiwork. And that's why it's important to repent. And then he continues, this idea of free will is a major principle of our belief, because without it, you don't have Torah. You can't have reward and punishment. You can't have the way telling us to do things if we can't do it. Quotes the verse in the end of the Torah, in the end of Devarim and Deuteronomy, See, behold, I have placed before you the good, the life, the bad, and the death. You have the choice. What do you want? You want the red pill or the blue pill? That's a cultural reference. You want the good or the bad? You want the life or the death? Which one do you want? Make a choice. And the Torah, of course, urges us, coaxes us, tries to encourage us, choose life. And then he quotes another verse. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 5. If only, this is God speaking, if only they had a heart. If only they had fear of God. If only they would do the mitzvahs. It's almost like God is wishing. God's wishing because he has no say. They have free will. It's their choice whether they want to fear God. It's not God's choice. So God can only hope but he can't effectuate, he can't determine. And then he adds, if God de decreed upon man to be righteous or wicked, and he placed something which pulled man deterministically to towards one path versus another, towards one perspective versus another, to towards one way of behavior, towards one action over the other? How can, we be, how can we be commanded by the prophets, do this, don't do that, improve your ways, don't follow your wicked path? If it's all predetermined, we have no say. So all of Torah, 
hinges upon the existence of free will. Now, the Ram's going to get into our question, but wait a minute. The Almighty determines what's happening, or he knows what's going to happen, but he does it in two ways. I think it's interesting to kind of follow his progression. He also follows this system of start with the easier question and then go to the more advanced, to the more difficult question. So he poses, again, a similar question, not quite the question that we started off with, but he's edging closer towards the very difficult question that we're trying to resolve. He says, wait a minute. The whole world is a fulfillment of the will of God. And he quotes a verse to this effect. Everything the mighty is desirous, he made. And if he made everything... It must be that everything is a fulfillment of the Almighty's wishes. Now, does the Almighty wish us to do good or bad? He wants us to do good. And therefore, how can we choose bad? How can we go against God's wishes? How can anything go against God's wishes? So this is like a softer version of the question. Free will, by definition, means that a person can choose good, namely the wishes of God, or can choose bad, namely to violate the wishes of God. But the existence of free will means that there's the capacity to choose bad. Wait a minute. Everything the mighty wants in the world, his desires, his will, that's what he created. So how can free will exist? Because free will, by definition, includes the option, the optionality, the possibility of a poor choice, a choice that violates the will of God. So there's a much softer version of the question. And he gives, I think, an answer that makes a lot of sense. And he says that there's the higher wish of God, meaning the Almighty's will is that people have free will. The Almighty wants us to have the option to choose bad, and therefore, even though that choice would be something that would go against the will of God. The fact that we have that choice, that is the will of God. And then he explains, just as the creator desires that fire and wind should ascend and water and dust should descend and the whole system of the galaxies and the orbits should all work as he determined, in the same way that he chose that, he chose or he wished that a person should have the ability to determine his destiny. All his deeds are in his hands and no one should compel him. No one should coerce him. No one should pull him in one way or the other. Rather, he himself, with his choices, with his capacity, should choose the way that he wants. The Almighty desires that people have the ability to defy him. And therefore, there's judgment. If you do good, you get rewarded. If you do bad, you get punished. You have all the choices ahead of you. Choose what you want, but the consequences of your choices are very real. So that's a softer version of the question that inherent in free will is the capacity to choose bad, and the mind doesn't want bad. And then he adds, he answers it, that the mind does want the capacity to choose bad, and that's the will of God. But then the Ram imposes the paradox that we started off with. This is the strong version of the question. And the strong version of the question is that it doesn't seem possible, given what we know about the definition of God, It doesn't seem possible for free will to actually exist. The idea of God knowing everything ahead of time, that seems to violate the idea that a person can make free will choices. They seem to be mutually exclusive. Shema Toma, perhaps you may say, God, the Holy One, blessed is He, He knows what will happen even before it happens. That's, That's the principle of total divine omniscience. Before things even happen, past, present, future, the mind knows it all. 
And therefore, only one of the following can be true. That's the question. Does God know that this person will be a tzaddik or a rasha? A righteous person, a wicked person? If God knows that he will be a righteous person, it's not possible in any version for that person to not end up a tzaddik. And if you say that God knows he'll be a tzaddik, but it's still possible for him to be a rasha, well, then God doesn't know. Pick your poison. Does God know ahead of time the future destiny of every person? If no, well, then that violates the principle of total divine omniscience. If yes, well, then that violates the principle of a person having free will. These two do not seem compatible. It doesn't seem that they can coexist. This is the dilemma, and the Ram just throws it right at us. It's important to note that the dilemma is actually featured earlier in a Mishnah in Perkei Avos. <coughs> Excuse me. This is in chapter 3 of Perkei Avos. It's authored by the great Rabbi Akiva. And he addresses it with four words. Hakol Tzafui. Everything is foreseen. Vaharishus nesuna, but permission is still given. Four words addressing this very weighty subject. The Almighty's foreknowledge does not eliminate our free will. He sees everything, but nevertheless, harishus nesuna, permission is granted. Everything is foreseen, yet people are allowed to make their choices. Their choice is their own. So Rabbi Kiva kind of, he says that they're both true, but he doesn't explain how they're both true. How is it possible when they seem to be mutually exclusive? Now, before we get into the Ramam's answer, it's important to note that throughout history, this is a question that people would refrain from talking about. And I think they withheld from talking about it for a very good reason. It's a very juicy question. It's a very satisfying question. But it's not a very satisfying answer. Because the only way the answer can resonate is if you have a dose of humility and really a dose of maturity. And therefore, people would refrain from talking about it because the question really resonates, but the answer can only be appreciated by someone who is humble, by someone who's mature, which is why I'm comfortable talking about it with you, because I have very high opinions of you. But again, we're just following the Rambam, and what he explains is a very deep idea. And the way he frames it, it's just, it's just beautiful. And if you've ever had the privilege of reading Rambam, the way he introduces it, he gives a little short preamble. It's, it's, it's an idea or it's a formulation that should perk you awake. If, I, if you were sleeping and I just read you this citation from the Rambam, you would right away wake up. That's how beautiful it is. He says like this, Da, you should know. The answer to this question Arucha me'eretz mita. It is longer than the land and broader than the sea and many great principles and lofty mountains hinge upon it. He's telling us we're about to get into something very, very weighty. A subject that's not an easy subject to just talk about flippantly. There's a lot going on over here. And the answer is as long as the land and as broad as the sea. By the way, that's a verse in Scripture talking about Torah. Torah is infinite. It's as long as the land and as broad as the sea, which is, again, the, the idea of, of uh, how vast it could be. Just think of the Pacific Ocean. Very, 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 very vast. And we know we have a little teaspoon, you know, 
We'll try to scoop up a little bit. And he tells us something a little bit mind-bending. We have already explained in chapter 2 of the laws of the foundation of Torah that God does not know of knowledge that is outside of him, like humans. Humans, they and their knowledge are two. You, your essence, and your knowledge are two separate things. I could tell you something now. You didn't know yesterday. You're the same person. <coughs> Excuse me. You're the same person that you were yesterday, but your knowledge accrues. You learn new things. Your knowledge can, you, you can add to the repository of knowledge that you have, but it's not you. God's knowledge doesn't work like that. God and his knowledge are one. But human intellect is precluded from understanding that. We cannot fathom knowledge that is not cumulative, that doesn't accrue, that's totally fused with the essence of that thing. There is a difference between divine knowledge and human knowledge. Humans are distinct from their knowledge. God is one with his knowledge, but this concept is unfathomable to human intellect. And then he gives us an analogy. And just like there is no ability in man to understand the essence of God, quotes a verse in Exodus, no one can see me and live. No one can fully appreciate God and live. So too, just like you cannot appreciate the essence of God, the idea of the infinite, the concept even of infinity, is not something that humans can really fathom because we are limited to understand the things that are only finite. So too, just like we cannot understand the infinity, the infinite of God, so too, we don't have the ability to understand the knowledge of God. Quotes a verse in Isaiah. I read it with the cantillation marks. My thoughts are not like your thoughts. The way you work is not like the way I work. And your ways are not like my ways. The way the humans work, the way the humans process knowledge, the way the humans think is not the way that God thinks. And therefore, we don't know how God knows what he knows ahead of time. But we know for sure that we have free will. What the Ram's doing is he's separating these two principles into different categories of things. One of them is beyond us. We cannot understand how God knows things. Because the whole system of divine knowledge works differently than our system of knowledge. But free will, that we know for sure, that a person has the choice and God does not per pull him, does not decree upon him to do what the person chooses to do. And then he adds, this is not just something we accepted based upon, you know, religious dogma. This is something that we know for sure that the deeds of man the choices of man are theirs alone, and this is something that all the words of prophecy are dependent upon. Is this a satisfying answer? Did the Ram even answer the question? He explains that the, the question, the question of, all, well, the Almighty knows everything ahead of time. He explain, he's explaining that this question assumes that divine knowledge is the same as human knowledge. But it's not. Not only is divine knowledge completely different than ours, it is completely incomprehensible to us, just as God himself is not something a human can fathom, can fully grasp. Can we understand an existence 
that is decoupled from time? Can we understand an existence that exists simultaneously in the past, in the present, and in the future? We cannot. That's why the name of God that symbolizes his existence outside of time is ineffable. We cannot even say it because it's beyond human capacity. He is not bound by the rigid constraints that are inflexible in our world. He created this world and he created everything within it to have those limitations. And his knowledge is not time-based. It's not cumulative. We change, we process. We, us and our knowledge are different. We learn new things. Those new things get encoded or changed as a result. God remains unchanged with his knowledge because him and his knowledge are one. It's not a linear process. It operates on a completely different wavelength using a different system of rules than our world. And therefore, we can understand, tells us the Rambam, how they don't conflict. Now, the reason why it's an unsatisfying answer is because it requires us to accept that there are things that we are precluded from understanding. We cannot fathom a different system of knowledge. My thoughts are not like your thoughts. I did see the following elucidation by Rabbi Mati Berger in a book titled The Eye of the Needle. I want to read it to you. I thought it was really clever. It was so short. You know, there's really, there's really two schools of opinions of how to deal with this question. Either you go through the Rambam and you read it like we try to read it and try to understand it. What, what do we understand? What do we not understand? Or you try to give a sharp one-line answer. And here is the sharp one-line answer version of it. Question. If God knows the future, how is it possible for human beings to have free will? Boom. Straight to the point. So let me read you the answer. When we look back in history to a particular event, our knowledge of what took place at that time does not in any way limit the choices of the people who actually participated then. They had complete freedom to choose as they did. We are merely aware of what they choose. For example, the fact that we know John F. Kennedy chose to ride a motorcade in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963, and was subsequently shot, allegedly, that was my insertion, does not interfere with his free will to have chosen that course of action. Can we, like, we know about this event, but no one would suggest that because we know about this event, now, afterwards, that that in some, is somehow encroached upon his free will at the time, However, human beings cannot know the future. Therefore, if we would know exactly what someone is going to do in the future situation, it must mean that the person had only one fixed option in that situation. In other words, person A's foreknowledge of person B's action makes it logically impossible for person B to have complete freedom of choice. However, God's nature differs from man's in a way that illuminates the contradiction between foreknowledge and free will. God exists outside of time. 100 years ago, today, and 100 years from now, all exist simultaneously before him. Therefore, God can always, quote, look back at our choices without affecting them. Even our future choices can be viewed by God in retrospect. And so God's knowledge of what we have chosen, presently choose or will choose in the future, is not an impediment of our free will. Boom. That's how he ends this subject, which I, I find it to be a nice, a nice a heuristic of how to think about this. My knowledge of my yesterday's choice today doesn't affect my yesterday's choice then, obviously, because that was then and now is now. I, I, I exist, so to speak, now post that choice or outside of that choice. The Almighty exists outside of time, and therefore, only because we are conflating divine knowledge and the way uh, the way God, so to speak, knows things, and human knowledge, as if God knows something ahead of time. No, God doesn't know something ahead of time. God knows something 
outside of time. Our question only stems from us ascribing to God the same kind of knowledge system that we have, but he exists outside of time, and therefore it's not logical to ask the question as if God exists within time. I think it's inaccurate to say that God knows what we're going to choose before we choose. He doesn't exist in time, and his knowledge is not like ours, which is cumulative within time. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's a statement from the Arizal. He says, where Yediyah, where divine foreknowledge exists, free will does not exist. Where free will exists, divine knowledge does not exist. There are different dimensions. We exist within time. Within time, we made free will choices. God's knowledge is outside of the system, and therefore it cannot impact us who are living within the system. I think there's another helpful way of framing this to make it a little bit more understandable. You know, the Rambam, he talks about theology, the definition of God, God's knowledge of everything, and God's omnipotence and omniscience. And he talks about free will. And he poses the contradiction between the two, not where he talks about God, but where he talks about free will, laws of repentance. His question is, you know, how does divine omniscience not derail free will? Is there anyone that really operates as if free will does not exist? We spoke about earlier how there's such a broad diversity of human beings, good ones and bad ones and evil ones and amazing, spectacular ones. We see with our own eyes how people are so different and make such different choices and live such different kinds of lives. We know this to be true implicitly. The whole idea of reward and punishment, is there anyone that really doesn't believe? Again, putting aside divine reward and punishment, do we not believe that criminals should be prosecuted? I think there is probably a few people that say that. But the mainstream and the way it's always been historically, the righteous are rewarded in our world. Forget about God for a second. Forget about the divine reward and punishment system. In our world, we, we give kudos. We give a bravo. We give a hurrah. We give medals and awards to the righteous people who do good things, to the firefighters who make heroic choices, to the uh, soldiers who act in valor and heroism. And we punish, and we criminalize, and we we uh, incarcerate, and we fine criminals. The whole idea of moral punishment presupposes free will. Moreover, I think on a more basic level, without free will, life really has no meaning. If I'm just a pawn in the hand of another, my actions are meaningless. Success and failure only matter because they're not assured, they're not predetermined. Of course, the Torah says without free will, there's no Torah. The whole idea of character improvement, this ideal that we could, you know, it's the beginning of the year, let's have a, the best year possible. Oh, it's a New Year's resolution. Stop eating all those carbs that last to like, I don't know, January 7th, January 10th. By, by when is everyone binging on carbs again? I don't know, but it's, it's, it's about to come. That whole idea presupposes free will. The idea of morality of good and bad is irrelevant without the capacity to choose. My grandfather used to always quote Rav Hutner, who said that the last frontier of heresy is heresy in the belief of free will. Oh, the criminal made those choices because of X, Y, and Z. They had a bad influence. They grew up in a bad neighborhood. They 
They were inspired. They were radicalized. That is the heresy. The la- that, is the, that is the final heresy, we're told, before Messiah. And that heresy and its essence is a refusal to accord agency. People have agency. They determine their behavior. It's also a refusal to accord meaning to life. In all likelihood, it's a reflection of people's own desires to overcome their feelings of you know personal failing. But again, if you believe in any system of reward and punishment for behavior, you implicitly believe in free will. Now, if you look at that Rambam that we mentioned earlier, on the side, and the margins, you have the comments and the rebuttals of the rival. And if you've ever had the great privilege of studying in the yeshiva, you know that sometimes there are some fireworks when these two giants, these two medieval sages, when they disagree. And in every book of Rambam, you have the rebuttals right on the side. <laughs> on the page, in the margins, they'll have right away the rebuttals. So in this particular statement in the fifth chapter of the Laws of Repentance, the Ravid has a particularly feisty rebuttal. And if you examine what he says, he says a version of the same answer, but in a way that I think he tries to make a little more palatable. But he's also trying to wrestle with the problem that this whole subject is us trying to dip our toe into God's system and we're not capable of understanding it and therefore it's it's something that's really it's hard it's hard to resolve in a satisfying fashion so he says I want to read it to you Amar Avram Abraham said his name was Abraham the rival his first name was Abraham and he always introduced his his comments with Amar Avram Abraham said this author did not follow the policy of previous authors. And that is, if you don't have a good answer, don't bring up a question. And you asked a very difficult question, but you don't give a satisfying answer. And what's going to be that uh, someone's going to read the question and not going to appreciate the answer, and they'll maybe they'll veer off to heresy. It's better, it would have been much better to just rely on the innocence of the simpletons. Now you've given them grounds for making a mistake. And he says, you know what, even though I don't have a great answer to the question, because you broke the question, I'll give you my answer. That's what he says. It's not a winning answer, but I'll try. So what he says is that the Almighty knows what's going to happen, but he doesn't decree what's going to happen. And the Almighty's knowledge of the future events is not like a decree, but it's like a determination given to the stars that the stargazers can look at the stars and see the future. And it's a little fuzzy because we don't know exactly what they see. We had a couple of weeks ago, for example. Actually, we have this week as well. But two weeks ago, we had the stargazers. Rashi tells us in the first chapter of of, of Exodus, Rashi tells us the stargazers, they saw in the stars that the savior of the Jewish people is going to be hamstruck by water. And therefore, let's take all the Jewish babies and even the Egyptian babies and chuck them into the Nile. But they were wrong because Moshe wasn't going to die in the water. He is going to be indeed punished because he hit the rock. It's supposed to speak in the rock to emit water. Similarly, actually in our Parsha, Parsha's bow, we have the... Uh, the interaction between between Moshe and Pharaoh, and Pharaoh already wants to yield, but he says, how how could you go? Don't you see that Ra'ah is upon you? And Rashi tells us that there's this this star that's called Ra'ah. We don't know anything about these things, but it it, it, uh, portends to bloodshed and and dying, and and they said, oh, if you go out of Egypt, you're all going to die. Because look, there's so much blood in your future. That's what the stars tell us. And then she says, well, they got it wrong because there was blood in the future, but it was the blood of circumcision. It's a good kind of blood, not the bad kind of blood. That's what we, we read in our Parsha. 
God's knowledge is still fuzzy up in the ear. It's still negotiable. That is, it's not a decree. It's not like set in stone. That is how the Riva tries to answer this. And then he says, well, it's not a good answer. It's not a great answer. It's, uh, it's something that we should never have brought up because now we're in trouble. So again, we, t- we spoke about this earlier. There's a tradition to avoid this, to just follow the simple formulation. But I think that when we really read the Rambam and try to understand what he's telling us, I think we have a good answer. The answer is, is that you cannot fathom God. I, I always think about this, you know, this, this question. If you took all of history's greatest engineers and the greatest technology that we have, can all of humanity just replicate a single fruit fly? All I want is one. One, the identical fruit fly. Just give me another one of these. Start with the raw materials. Take the fruit fly and grind it up. Take all those materials and try to assemble it back together into a fruit fly that can re- that can reproduce, replicate, and the, all the systems that govern that animal. Just just one tiny fruit fly. You can't do it. We're small. We're little bugs compared to God, even obviously much less. We're nothing. We can't do anything. We're feeble. But we have hubris. We think we're so smart. We're so intelligent. And it's such a clever question. And it is a clever question. God knows ahead of time. Says the Ram Nero. You got it wrong. God doesn't know ahead of time. God knows outside of time. And therefore, to conflate a system that is bound to time with a system that is outside of time is illogical. And therefore, even though we can't understand how it works, we still know. And again, we intuitively live our lives that free will, in fact, exists. I think it's an interesting subject. I think it's actually quite fascinating. And it does help round out this whole idea of of the mighty system of knowledge. Tenth principle of the 13 principles, God knows everything. This is going to lead us into the 11th principle, which is the system of reward and punishment. And we're getting closer towards the juicier parts of the 13 principles that y'all have been so patiently waiting for. What happens after you die? What's hell like? What's heaven like? Tell me more about resurrection. What about reincarnation? Am I going to have my fit body from the age of 20? Or am I going to have all these wrinkles? What's going to be when I come back? All these interesting questions, please, that we'll get to. I'm not sure if we're going to do any more sessions on the 10th principle, because there's still more to talk about. I'm thinking maybe to jump into the 11th principle and just go into reward and punishment because it's really spicy stuff. But there's still a lot more to talk about, about how exactly divine providence works. What about animals? That's a question that's discussed uh, at great length in the literature. There's so much on this subject, how they might intervenes with the world. When does he intervene? When does he not intervene? What about uh, history? How do we look at history through this prism? But uh, we'll see how we go about uh, the next session on this subject. I found this to be a very interesting one. Even though it's a hard subject, I'm acknowledging that ahead of time. It's it's a hard subject. It's a, it's a demanding subject. It, again, demands more than anything. It demands us having a little bit of uh, humility, which is really hard for us humans because we're so confident in our abilities. But maybe that's the best takeaway of this subject is that a little dose of humility is helpful sometimes, certainly when we're talking about God and the infinite. These are concepts that we are designed to not fully understand. I hope you enjoy this. My email address is rabbiwobachimba.com. It's 2022. Hopefully this will be the year of Torah, the year that we could all agree upon just more Torah study. Everyone benefits, your soul benefits, your body benefits, your family benefits, the community benefits. Everyone is better off. Make this the year of great Torah study.